I am um, Dick Proust. I was Petit's student. Uh, did my dissertation uh, under his direction on Michael Polanyi back in 1970. And I went off to teach at uh, a small liberal arts college uh, about 100 miles south of Durham, St. Andrews Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. uh, was part of a two-person philosophy department for many years, uh, which means that you become a generalist and you find yourself teaching in the areas that, that uh, I, I was teaching, introduction to logic and symbolic logic, that sort of thing and aesthetics and business ethics and ethics and lots of lots of stuff the things that intrigued me most were the philosophy of law and ethics and um uh in the course of my years there um i got involved with a group of people and i'm going to inject a little commercial here a, a group of people called the personalist form it's a it's a bunch that um, uh, that meets we're folk who like I think people in this petite conference who are convinced that uh, persons are actual beings uh, despite the fact that in the social and behavioral sciences particularly uh, the decision has been made to get along without that category. Um, so that in, in, even in behavioral psychology, or, or at least experimental psychology, where you would expect if anybody would honor the notion of a person, it would be a psychologist. So many of them say, well, no, we're going to study behavior. We're not going to talk about persons anymore. So this group, the personalist, uh, the, the, the form on persons, um, is a bunch of folk uh, in uh, theology, philosophy, psychology, even neuropsychology, uh, who meet uh, every other year and we alternate one side of the Atlantic or the other. Um, and uh, we met in Lund, uh, Sweden, last summer. It's probably about it's probably about the same size as this group, or maybe maybe half again as large. And we're going to be meeting at the University of uh, Boston, uh, Boston University, um, next summer. So I, I'm going to see if it, Dale will give me all your emails and let, let you know about it and see if I can entice some of you into, uh, into coming up there if you have a chance. Anyway, I am, along with uh, my fellow personalists, uh, convinced that there are at least some discourses that we accredit as rational where we can't get by without identifying persons. And that is particularly true in theology, uh, it is true in moral reasoning, and it is true in legal reasoning. And uh, in moral and legal reasoning, uh, we can't get along without the notion of a person because simply studying behavior does not identify a subset of our behavior for which we take personal responsibility. Um, and that's the trick. In, in, as far as I'm concerned, a doctrine of personal identity has to have, uh, has to determine a sphere of our action to which we are accountable as persons. And it's got to square with the intuitions that I think you I, I, our papers have more to do with each other than I thought. Okay. Uh, uh, that, that our, your intuitions, I think, in, in solving the problems that you're confronted with, have to do with thinking, can this be a flourishing person? And what I've been giving my career over to is coming up with an account of identity that informs our intuitions in moral and legal and theological contexts. And um, I wrote a book about 10 years ago uh, in which I addressed a bunch of problems in the philosophy of religion that I think can be solved with an understanding of a person as a character of action, uh, and particularly a character of resolute action. Let me just, in a nutshell, tell you what I mean by that. If I asked you to make a list of 10 or 15 things that you are presently doing in the present continuing sense, 
relationships that you're carrying on, professional responsibilities, hobbies, plans, whatnot. Um, it would be true, if you think about it, that you project a course of action into the future that roughly coordinates those various intentions that you have right now so that they get accomplished as well as you can imagine them getting accomplished. In other words, you try to resolve your intentional life. My contention is that the only way we can resolve a set of actions is through narrative. And I, I, I picked up on the fact that you found it relevant to think of the person's story yes. uh, in order to make the moral decisions. And, and I think in, intuitively that's what we do when we understand one another's actions as a person. Um, right now I'm working on a, a, another book uh, called Those We Judge, The Logic of Personal Identity in Moral and Legal Reasoning. So I'm taking the same model of, of a person as the resolute character of somebody's present action and applying it to a variety of issues. So when I came to this conference, or when I, when I decided to come to this conference, uh, and thought about um, where I am with Petit and Polanyi and how they have informed where I'm going and where I'm going beyond them, if I am going beyond them, that is, the, that is what I'm trying to address in, in this very short paper. Um, Persons are primary, and, 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 and I, I love the fact we're calling this conference the pri primacy of persons because I think that what informs us as people who appreciate Polanyi and Poti is the bedrock commitment to persons being actual beings. And uh, Poti believed that, and I think you and I believe that, and that notion has become very problematic since the death of this kind of substantial selfhood vision in philosophy where we are souls embodied and uh, separable Cartesian, you know, the whole, the whole story. Um, and as I see part of Bill's, Bill Poteet's project in his own work much of it had to do with recovering the person as an identifiable being. If I think of the, some of the people that we talked about uh, in, our, in, in the session this morning, um, Merleau Ponty, uh, uh, Kierkegaard, uh, Sartre, Transcendence of the Ego, and, and those of us who've taken Ponty courses at various stages, at ver in various decades would probably have different people on the list. But, but all of them, in, in some way, I think, were recovering, trying to recover uh, personhood from the kinds of reductionisms that are current uh, in, our, in, in the last couple of hundred years. Bill's approach to the problem of, of identity was often to try to direct our attention to what was unique, what is unique about using the first person personal singular pronoun nominative case. Those of you who've been in his courses could probably hear him saying that. Um, and what he found in our use of I was a kind of reflexivity that, is, uh, that, that he saw demonstrated in its use. That is to say, and I want to quote him here, I has two references. It does not just name a person, such as does William H. Petit. It names the namer. It reco recoils on language and its user. It is about, I will now call them, acts. But it is, for me, also about something more, namely the actor. So when I use the word I, I'm giving this talk, if I use the word I, chances are, unless it's a highly artificial situation, 
it's I am doing such and such, or I feel such and such, or... Um, so it's I and a character of action. Uh, and, um, and that means that the word I, the reference of the word I, refers to both an agent and an action. And that's what makes it reflexive. Um, now, all that sounded rather subversive back in the 60s and uh, 70s. Uh, by framing the problem of identifying a person in terms of the active awareness of somebody using the pronoun I, Poteet bypassed the fruitless approach then standard among philosophers of personal identity. The received way to talk about a person um, was to treat a person as a subject to which one could assign a certain quality, attribute, or other category membership that qualifies it as a person. The classic is Boethius. What is a person? It is a substance that reasons, uh, or is rational, I should say. So, you know, the usual philosophical approach to identifying a person is to set it up as one category, membership in another category. Um, and uh, that tradition uh, has long since been given up with the, uh, given up the notion of, excuse me, the received way to treat a person as a subject to which one could assign a certain quality, attribute, or category membership that qualifies it as a person. Though that tradition had long since given up the notion of substantial selfhood, most philosophers uh, trying to identify persons um, continued to speak of persons as though they could be identified prior to and other than by what they did. So P.F. Strawson, for instance, said a person is an individual with both states of consciousness and corporeal characteristics. Or for Harry Frankfurt, someone with second order desires. Or for Lynn Baker, Lynn Rutter Baker, someone with a continuing first person perspective. So when Petit pointed out that when I say I, to state what I'm doing or should do or will do, like I shot the sheriff or I hope you're doing well, I refer both to my act and its actor. And he was departing radically from the usual assumptions we make about personal identity or philosophers make. He was making the mode of being mind bodily in the world radically and irreducibly intentional. Now, <clears throat> I would like to suggest that to call the use of the pronoun I reflexive poses a peculiar problem for Polanyans. Polanyi demonstrated that knowing what I am doing has a from to structure. <coughs> the to pole is my awareness of what my, my moves are actualizing. The from pole is the tacit coefficient of my intentional focus. And that tacit dimension is what Polanyi recognized as the personal dimension. <coughs> but if the personal is tacit in our awareness, then how could we conceivably identify it? I think that's a little bit of a puzzle. And um, I don't think Petit got us very far in solving that problem. Um, by insisting that our use of I is reflexive, Potit suggests that we attend not only to what we are doing, but from the character, uh, but from the character of those actions to a being that comprehends them or holds them together. That is to be reflexive is to say, I am speaking to you, but then seeing that action as though looking back at the generator that the agent of that action as really a complex of intentional behavior 
uh, that I think can only be unpacked in a narrative. What holds acts together are narratives. So the second from to comprehension that accomplishes reflexivity attends to something like a narrative identity, a narrative comprehension of what we are aware of doing. Put it another way, if I watch you do something and know you well as a person, I can look at what you are doing, but I can also look back at the narrative context in which your action has meaning for you. Now, I don't know much of your narrative, perhaps, but I know if I know you personally, I know at least some of the strands of your intentional life that are being coordinated and in which your present action is contextualized. That means we emerge personally as the character of something like a story. Simply being active is not enough. Uh, Mozart's Don Juan, everybody remember Kierkegaard's teaching us uh, the uh, immediate stages of the erotic, uh, Poti teaching us that, that Kierkegaard thing. Uh, Don Juan was certainly active uh, in España, son Gia Mie et Trent. But he was only musically active. He was always disappearing into the moment. And without a narrative, he could not emerge as a person. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you if you haven't read that piece by Kierkegaard. But using the reflexive eye means not only being aware of what one is doing immediately, but being aware of advancing a story. So right now, you're aware of sitting, trying to make sense out of this <laughs> difficult abstract paper, but you're also aware that uh, you are, you're in, in a continuum. You, you're, your action is moving forward, and this is one episode in it, and you're, you're aware of advancing your own story. In using the first person, personal I, then, Implicit in one's awareness is awareness both of one's act and its narrative context. That's, that's how I unpack the notion of reflexivity. As far as I know, Bill never set out to provide a systematic account of personal identity. Um, dealing with Gilbert Ryle type reductions of his day, it suffice to point out the personal tacit coefficient for all acts of knowing. But I would suggest that the reductionisms current in these several decades later need a full-fledged account of personal identity. There are, after all, discourses that purport to be rational but cannot function without identifying persons, like, as I mentioned, those that we use in law and theology and moral judgment. If in the face of the pervasive skepticism about personal identity, and I think that's part of what it means to be a critical thinker in our era, uh, is to be skeptical about personal identity, then we can give no coherent account of identity, and, and we can give no coherent account of identity, um, then we have no way to legitimize our judgments when we make a moral decision, like you've been talking about, or even a legal decision. You know, sometimes, so imagine you're a judge and, and um, the person on trial <clears throat> testifies, this is something that he or she did a decade ago when they've just been caught. You would understand it if they said, I'm not the same person that I was then. Meaning, you know, we might have a hard time knowing exactly when that's justifiable, but intuitively we know that it is the present character of our resolve that forms the core of who we presently are. Now, presumably most of us are in narrative continuity with what we have done over the last 10 years, but not everybody is. And I think, um, in other words, we, we have an intuition there that, that comes, in, in my experience, close to an understanding of personal identity as the present character of somebody's resolve. <clears throat> so, what does the reflexive use of I suggest about how we should reason about persons? I think Bill got us this far. He was clearly 
he was clear about the wrong way to reason about persons. He fully recognized that the logic governing personal narratives is not categorical in the Aristotelian sense. Uh, it does not specify, it does not identify by specifying category membership or exclusion. So the patterns of inference available in what passes for standard reasoning in Aristotle's logic simply are not able to grasp the being of persons. And I can tell you for sure that that was Clotet's attitude. Uh, I got to tell you a little anecdote. When, when I first started teaching at St. Andrews, um, <clears throat> I invited Bill down. Uh, I wanted my students to, to have some sense of this guy who'd been my mentor. And um, I was teaching logic at the time, and I think this was about 1968 or 69. Well, he was in Greece then. It must have been a little bit later. Uh, and he generously came down, and he was in fine form. His public talk was well attended, and uh, I was really thrilled because he lived up to my expectations that I wanted my young scholars to hear him. And, and among all these enthralled people who uh, showed up at his, at his uh, public address, he'd attended several classes, but he gave one public address, um, some of my, my introduction to logic students were there. And one of them asked him um, during the Q&A, uh, Dr. Poti, do you think it's worthwhile take, taking a course in college logic? And of course, I'm standing in the back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and Poti says, no, it's absolutely worthless. I mean, you know, I, now everybody, everybody in the room knew he was pulling my leg. And, he, and of course, all the gleeful eyes of the students looked at me, you know, blushing in the back of the room. But I knew that what he was saying uh, was doing more than pulling my leg. He, he, he was saying that we cannot reason in explicit categories and talk about class membership or category membership, as Aristotle taught us to do, and get at what's, what our real identity as a person is. Um, he was saying that in reasoning, that the reasoning we do in explicit categories cannot serve us dependably in reasoning about characters of action, that is about persons and what they do. Of course, that's right out of Polanyi. You can't be explicit. It's tacit. I would venture that to capitalize on this re recognition, we need to get clear about the differences between reasoning about action with categories and reasoning about action with narratives. I am convinced that we really reason with two logics. We really reason systematically in a lot of contexts in a way that can be put into Aristotle's standard forms, the standard categorical reasoning. Um, but <clears throat> the next step has got to be in making clear what's distinctive about the reasoning we do when I draw conclusions about your person on the basis of your action or what I understand about the narrative continuity of what you do. Um, and I, had, I am going to call that character logic as opposed to categorical logic um, because I think the reflexivity that Poteet talks about is manifest in that notion of a character because a character both identifies a character of my action and I am a character. So the word character includes both the identity of an act and the identity of an actor. A person does an identifiable character of action and a person is an identifiable character of action. Let me indicate two distinct differences between categorical logic and what I'm calling character logic here, because I think this will at least give you a little hint about what I'm trying to do. First, the relationship between a person's character and the character of his or her action is logically one of mutual implication. Let me, put, let me try to put the matter more formally. 
Suppose I said person P does character of action C. Then I mean to say that C is implicit in P and P is implicit in C. C, the character of what you do is implicit in who you are and who you are is implicit in what you do. Um, provided you're acting in accord with your resolve, it must be that your resolution has the present character of what you're doing as an ingredient. It's part of your narrative. And if I'm defining you by your narrative, what you do is implicit in who you are. Likewise, if I know you as a person, I see you in the character of what you're doing. We recognize that in legal terms by saying, a criminal cannot be found guilty unless he or she is implicated in what they do. That is to say, um, a person must be, to use the etymology of the word implicated, which is really mind bodily present, as, as Poteet would say, that a lot of etymologies. A person is implicated in that the person is enfolded in the narrative context of the character of what he did. That's one, so, now that's not true in categorical logic. If I say all rabbits are white, the, the notion of um, the meaning of rabbit is not, does not imply its whiteness. The meaning of white does not imply rabbit. They're not mutually implicated the way I think it functions in character logic. And the second crucial feature of our reasoning about acts and persons has to do with how they are related temporally. All characters of action have their being in a particular moment. It turns out, if you think about this now, that the moment of a person's present action and the moment of his present character resolve are also mutually inclusive. We are both present in our action and our action is present in who we are. Now, recognizing this temporal feature of character logic opens up possibilities of reasoning about persons that are not available in categorical logic. Standard reasoning, standard categorical reasoning about persons is causal. That's the way the social and behavioral sciences largely act. When we, con when we construe an action as the outcome of a, cer of a certain set of causal antecedents, we're led to think of an act at occurring at a point in time, the time of the outcome of its causal antecedents. That's really the etymology of the word event, outcome. But the assimilation of acts to events, which most psychology and certainly other behavioral and social sciences um, operate with, uh, would make understanding your behavior, understanding on the basis of what happened temporally before you did what you did. And I'm saying in character logic, I have to understand the moment of your action and the moment of your resolve as being the same moment. Um, and that's why it's so intuitive when we raise questions of free will. Uh, free will is predicated on the notion that we are determined to do what we're doing because of its causal antecedents. And you and I uh, find that, because, uh, that, that counterintuitive because, because we're aware of acting through time. Our action is not something at a point in time. Um, causal language treats the moment as a point in time. It's the point at which certain causal outcomes came out the way they did. Character logic treats 
actions as having duration, as the character of an action persists from its inception to its completion. <clears throat> and in active awareness, an act's moment is very rarely punctiliar. Rather, it moves through the time it takes to accomplish the intention that characterizes it. And that makes it variable in volume, if you will, uh, since it includes all the moments of movement by which it is accomplished. And that's why we find it reason to call some actions momentous, having greater volume of moment than others. And that's something that can't be grasped in causal language. Now, this observation about the temporal logic of claims about persons and their actions, I also think gives the lie to uh, one of reduction, reductionism's most pernicious lines of reasoning. And I'm thinking of the post-structuralist claim here um, that uh, the character of a person and the character of his action inclusive his here, is incoherent given the contingency of meaning and the difference separating the poles of personal reflexivity. Uh, and that objection loses its force once we recognize that it is a volume of moment being actualized in a character of action. A person is actualized in the moment of what he or she does and his or her resolve includes the moment of what he or she is doing. And so any difference is innocuous, provided we understand persons the way I think we do intuitively as characters of resolve. Notice that by recognizing persons as momentary beings, I'm not implying that they're ephemeral beings. In fact, as creatures of resolve, we can be given to achievements whose projected accomplishment could even outlive us as uh, informing the character of movement in others who come after us. Our life achievements can be extended in their actualization through the legacy they provide for successors who take up the tasks they define. And since we're here at Yale to celebrate um, the primacy of persons and Bill's work against the reductionisms that deny it, uh, I think we can say that what we're doing here is momentous. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs>